Hello, welcome to this presentation of Mayer's Cognitive Theory of Multimedia. My name is Brett Darrington. I'm a graduate student in instructional technology at the University of Wyoming. I know everyone's asking right now, what is a cognitive theory of multimedia and where they can get one? Well, all the cool kids are anyway. But here, this is Mayer's Theory of Multimedia. It was developed by Richard Mayer, but before we get to that, we should look into the background behind the theory. You see, Mayer's theory draws heavily upon research and theories of those who came before. So here are a few of the theorists who helped Mayer along the way. First, we have John Sweller, a very handsome man. Dr. Sweller worked at the University of New South Wales in Australia. He's best known for his research into what he called cognitive load. Here's a few works that explain his theory. If you want to look further into his ideas, go ahead and pause the video, write down some of the articles. Don't worry, I'll be here when you get back. This stuff's important. Okay, now some more information on cognitive load. This idea seems to reverberate across much of modern educational theory, so it's something you might want to look more into if you haven't already. But for now, we'll just cover the basics. The basis behind the theory is that we each have a certain level of stress or load that our working memory can handle at any given moment. All learning tasks have a certain amount of load built into them, some more than others. Think back to your calculus class. Load that is not directly related to a learning task can be distracting and can inhibit learning. Because our working memory has limits, instructional designers should make sure that extraneous or extra load is kept to a minimum. For example, if a student spends all of their time fighting a slow computer during a writing assignment, their learning and writing may suffer because they cannot focus their attention on the writing task. The takeaway from this is that we need to get rid of extra elements so that learners can manage the load that, learning, that the learning task pace places upon them. Our next contributor is Alan Pivio. Pivio gave his ideas um, to us from up north in Canada at the University of Western Ontario. His major area of research is in something called dual coding theory. I don't have a picture here, but do a quick Google search of him and take a look at his earlier days as a bodybuilder. It's pretty impressive. Um, like the, the last researcher, like Sweller, once again, here are a couple of great books to write down if you want to. Pause the video, take some notes, and I'll get back to us later. Pavio theorizes that there's a separation between audio and visual interpretation in our minds. He calls this dual coding theory. The first of these two cognitions he called imagens, which are visuals which we interpret close to their reality. Thus, when we see a cat in real life or in a picture, our mind sees a four-legged animal with whiskers. Logogens, however, are more abstract. These are the words and symbols we use every day. Thus, when we see the word cat, we interpret the word to mean a four-legged animal with whiskers, even though the word itself is just a series of symbols. Here is a diagram of his model. Let's take a closer look. The main thing to notice is that according to this model, there are two channels or lanes through which we process information. These systems, one for verbal communication and one for nonverbal communication, run parallel to one another. But we use both to make sense of the world around us and the stimulus we get from one affects what we perceive in the other. We can use this theory to build upon the earlier idea of cognitive load, because each system can receive its own load independent of the other system. Therefore, it's possible to increase our potential cumulative load by splitting information across the two systems. For instance, listening to someone talk about fixing a bicycle as we watch them fix the bicycle. The takeaway from this is that we analyze verbal and visual communication in different ways. We also use both simultaneously and to our benefit. Additionally, if we can use both systems together to provide extra information without overloading one of our systems, we'll be better off. The third researcher is Alan Baddeley. He is a professor at the University of York in England, a rudy looking gentleman, if you must say. Here's a couple of his major works. As always, feel free to pause and write down anything that you find interesting. Badley's model is based on research that shows that visual and verbal interpretation can be done simultaneously. Not only can we perform a verbal and visual task at the same time, we can do them almost as efficiently as if we were completing each task on its own. However, 
If we try to complete two visual tasks at the same time, we will lose a lot of efficiency in carrying out the task. These separate systems are represented by the phonological loop through which we interpret sounds, the visuospatial loop through which we interpret visual stimuli, and the episodic buffer, which we used to remember chronological episodes or stories in the short term. Badly also theorized that we have what he called a central executive that can combine interpretations of media and can make decisions about what to pay attention to and what we should ignore. The central executive also helps us realize when we're getting off track and guides us to a better solution. The major takeaway for designers is that we can process language and visuals at the same time, but we don't process two visual or two language stimuli at the same time very well. Another takeaway is that our working memory makes many decisions about what to, it pays attention to. If we can simplify the decision-making process for the central executive, we should be able to monitor our learning better by decreasing our total load. All right, after that slight detour, let's get back to Richard Mayer. Dr. Mayer is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And as the main researcher behind the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, he is the star of this presentation. I'm going to talk about some aspects of this theory, but if you want to know more, feel free to look into any of these works and you'll get a good idea of the breadth and scope of his theory. Now here's the model. In this model, we see many of the principles found in the previous research, most notably the dual channels for verbal and visual media. Notice that this model starts with media presentation, words or pictures. We either hear or read words and we see pictures. We then select the words and images we'll pay attention to, and then, through our working memory, make sense of the multimedia using our prior knowledge as a guide. You should notice aspects of Pavio's, Sweller's, and Badley's work here. This really is an amalgamation of all their work, but Mayer and his colleagues made it work especially well for multimedia research. When Mayer combines his model with Sweller's cognitive load theory, we get seven principles, although there are more that apply in certain instances, that Mayer applied to the effective use of multimedia. I'm now going to provide a quick summary of each of these principles. First principle is the multimedia principle. This principle states that words and pictures are better than pictures or words on their own. Take a look at this first example. In this example, we have only a picture. The picture alone does not convey a lot of information. However, the second image, the combination of words and images creates a very instructive graphic explaining the water cycle. The combination of words and pictures is much more powerful than either would be on its own. Spatial contiguity principle states that words and pictures should appear close to one another. Notice in this first example that the images of the train, the caterpillar, etc., are separate from the text they are describing. Anyone who wants to use these pictures to help them make sense of the text must switch between looking at the images and reading the text. Switching causes extra load, and load frustrates learning. The further the text and images are from one another, the greater the load. Now, take a look at this second page from the same textbook. In this example, the text is right next to the image it describes. Combining these elements in this way makes it easier on the reading decreasing load, and enhancing the effectiveness of the learning material. All right, that pause was on purpose. The next principle is the temporal contiguity principle. This principle states that we should present audio and pictures at the same time, not in separate files or delayed like I just did. The way this works is if, for example, I presented the visual component of this presentation separately from the audio portion of the presentation, it would make things way more confusing. Obviously, keeping the audio and visual components separate would increase load, so I'd be in violation of the temporal contiguity principle. Overall, just don't do it. The coherence principle. This principle asks us to exclude material that does not pertain to the purpose of the lesson. This seems obvious, but many times we see learning materials that contain graphics that only serve 
a decorative purpose. Material that is not pertinent to the learning task is distracting and increases load. And as an example, take a look at this graph. And there's a lot going on here. The math problem that students need to solve does pertain to basketball, but excluding the border, there are seven graphic elements here. Trying to make sense of them all causes extraneous cognitive load and is a distraction from the purpose of the learning task. According to the coherence principle, a much simpler graphic might be better. The modality principle states that animation and narration are better than animation and on-screen text. Take a look at these screenshots from two YouTube videos. The first, a tutorial on how to eat a watermelon, which you should definitely check out if you have a chance, uses the visual instruction along with a narrator, although there is some pretty funny text inserted along the way. The second, from Northampton Community College, uses captions, although I'll let you know in a little secret, there is some narration as well, but for the sake of this example, we'll just pretend there isn't. The modality principle states that the narration is better than the captions. The reason this works is that our brains attempt to read the text and interpret the image at the same time using the same channel. However, if we take advantage of our audio and visual processing capabilities together, we can decrease the load on an individual channel, letting our ears and our auditory processing capabilities take some of the information burden on. The redundancy principle states that we should not present written words with graphics when there's also narration present. Wait a minute. I bet you're thinking right now, you just did that. Well, yeah, I did, but only because there are a few exceptions to the principle. The principle doesn't apply when there aren't any graphics on a page, such as this one, when technical language is used, or when the audience may have difficulties understanding the language. So yeah, the redundancy principle has quite a few exceptions. However, it's easily one of the most abused principles on the list, so we should try to avoid it as much as possible. The final principle is the individual differences principle. It states that multimedia effects work better for novice learners than they do for expert learners. In fact, some studies have shown that in some instances, multimedia can actually inhibit experts learning. So keep your audience in mind. While a novice might require a lot of media, an expert might be better off with just text. Finally, Here's a great source they wanted to give credit to for major help along the way. In conclusion, multimedia learning can be a powerful tool, especially when we wield its power for good. Hopefully, by understanding a few aspects of Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia, we can all create a world with better learning tools, cool costumes, and powerful rings.